Good evening, everyone. Delighted to welcome you all to the second Digital Leadership Series event of our academic year. For newcomers, our Digital Leadership Series event is focused on tackling issues that are re related to the to broader societal concerns and digital technology. Today, we're really excited to talk about with Mike Smith, we're planning to have a really exciting conversation about the future of universities in a digitally driven world. And I note that we've run a, a lot of academics from across the country uh, and, and, and uh, our regular uh, audience as well. So delighted that you could all join us as well and, and excited to see where this conversation takes us. I'm really excited about having this conversation for a variety of reasons. Uh, the first, of course, is that higher education has become a scarce resource. It's, it's increasingly out of reach for many potential students and their families. We've all read about the high debt load, and yet higher education has never been more important. It reminds me a little bit of the healthcare sector, where we have really high quality healthcare and really high quality educational opportunities, uh, but there's a lot of challenges associated with that. And as we all know, technology creates new opportunities for scale and, it's, and for reach, and it's important for us to consider how we might rethink and reinvent higher education. You know, speaking personally, I couldn't be happier to be part of the University of California system, which I think has done more than most universities to expand reach while not sacrificing quality and while still focusing on our research mission. At the Mirad School, We've expanded our use of technology to offer more and more programs, programs and classes actually uh, digitally. So everything from a remote undergraduate major in business to, to hybrid learning opportunities. So I'm excited to feature my friend, Mike Smith, who has thought deeply about these issues and for some time now actually, and he's the author of a forthcoming book from MIT Press. It's called The Abundant University Remaking Higher Education for a Digital World. Mike is a professor of technology and marketing at, at the Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz School. He's co-director of the Initiative for Digital Entertainment and Analytics at the university. And you'll see there's a bunch of parallel, parallels between these two sectors. And he was also named one of the top 100 emerging engineering leaders in the US by the National Academy of Engineering. He has a ton of achievements to his name. Uh, and so I'm just delighted that he could be here and talk to us about this. Uh, I must thank our benefactors, KPMG and the Beale Family Foundation, without whose support we could not offer this programming, which we are able to do uh, at no cost to attendees. So thank you for, to the benefactors and thank you all for joining us. Uh, logistically, we have disabled the chat feature. We're going to be using only, we take audience questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom webinars. Uh, we'll start at a, a little bit after maybe 6.10 or so, depending on how the conversations goes. The format is Mike will kick us off with his presentation. I'll ask him a few questions. And with so much talent in the room, I'm going to turn it over to you pretty quickly so that you can ask your questions about how you see uh, about the future of higher education in a digitally driven world. With that, let's welcome Mike. Mike, take it away. All right, Vijay, thank, thank you so much for uh... Very, very kind and generous uh, introduction. It's it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited about talking about these issues and and really excited about all the, all the people who uh, signed up and um, looking forward to both talking about the book and then also interacting with you on on your questions. So I've got about 25 minutes of. Um, material that I'd like I'd like to present and and in that 25 minutes I'm going to try to convince you of, of three things. Um, the first is that I'm going to argue I think we in higher education are much more vulnerable to digital transformation than many of us believe. Um, so I'm going to argue that that I think technology poses a much bigger threat to our continued power in the industry, that a lot of us would like to believe. That's number one. Number two is I'm gonna argue that even if you disagree with me about the threat technology poses to us, you know, even if even if you say, you know what, I don't, I don't think technology poses that much of a threat, I think we can continue to, to hang on to our powerful position in the industry as long as we want to. I'm gonna argue number two, that we should want to change. If we care about social justice anywhere near as much as we say we do, 
I'm going to argue we should be very, very embarrassed about the current state of social justice in higher education, and we should want to look for better outcomes. So we should want to change is number two. And then the third point I'm going to try to make is that I think the key to finding the energy to change as higher education, as an industry, I think the energy is going to come from us shifting from a focus where we're trying to protect our model of business towards a, a, an approach where we're looking to fulfill our mission um, as, as educators, okay? So that's, that's where I'm going in this talk. Let me, let me give you a little bit of background on how I got here, because it's kind of weird for me as, you know, sort of a business and management professor to be talking about higher education. You know, we don't, we don't talk about social justice a lot in the, in the business school classroom. I'm going to say that un, unapologetically. How did, we, how did I get here? The way I got here, so my, my research sits kind of at the interface between technology and marketing and economics. Um, and what I'm really interested in in that interface is how technology changes things, things like markets and things like industry power. Um, so my dissertation was written, written you know, 20 years ago uh, I, at, the, at the height of the dot-com boom. And I was thinking a lot about how technology might change retail markets. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, bold predictions. So one of the predictions I mentioned in my dissertation is a quote from uh, Robert Kuttner in 1998, writing in Business Week, where he says, the internet's a nearly perfect market and the result is fierce price competition, dwindling product differentiation and vanishing brand loyalty. And a lot of my dissertation work and a lot of my early work was really trying to empirically test those three hypotheses. And when you test them, what you find is that none of them turn out to be true. You know, that we don't see fierce price competition online. In fact, if anything, we, I would argue we see less price competition online markets versus offline markets. We don't see dwindling product differentiation. If anything, we've seen an explosion in product differentiation. And we don't see vanishing brand loyalty. And if we were doing this in a regular classroom, I'd say, how many people have shopped at Amazon in the last month? All of your hands would go up and I would say case closed, right? So I did a lot of work in that area and also trying to understand why were some of the early predictions so wrong. Um, around 2000, um, I got really interested in, in the entertainment industry. And the reason the entertainment industry is interesting to me is a lot of that early work was in what happens when we sell the same physical goods we've always sold in a digital marketplace, right? Take the books, CDs, and DVDs we've always sold. We'll just sell them online. In the 2000s, we started to see the digitization of those products. And once you start to digitize those products, you open up a whole new world of opportunity, right? In a world where it costs me five bucks to print a book or 250 to print a DVD, I can only profitably sell those products to people whose value is higher than five bucks or 250. In a digital world, when the price, when the marginal cost goes to zero, suddenly I can profitably sell those, those products to anybody, right? If, you're, if your value of this product is a nickel, I can profitably give that to you. I've got to figure out a way to, to still sell it to the people with the higher value, and we can talk about that, but it opens up a whole new part of the market that was excluded to me. The second thing that's interesting about digitization is it gives you so much more data about how the product is being consumed. Um, think about movie studios, right? When you sell movies in theaters or sell them on DVD, you know absolutely nothing about your customer and how they're using that product. When you provide movies digitally, all of a sudden I can see a whole bunch of really interesting things about how the person, you know, how this individual is consuming my product, what other products are they consuming, when are they watching, and I can use that to really customize how I present the content to them in ways that just weren't possible in the physical world, okay? So my colleague Rahul Talang and I got really interested in studying this industry. And what we noticed as we worked with the major publishing houses, major studios and, and major, major record labels is most of the questions they were asking were about how do we take technology and use it to replicate our old business model, right? 
how do we take technology and use it to keep doing the things we've always done? So I used to reach, re, release a book on hardcover and then a year later release it on paperback. Where should I release my Kindle, right? I used to sell music on CDs. How can I replicate that business model on iTunes um, and, on, and on and on and on? And at some point, Rahul and I started to wonder, you know, are, is, are those the right questions that you, the entertainment industry, ought to be asking? Or should you be asking more strategic questions? Should you be asking, does technology pose a threat to my business model. And this, this thinking came to a head for us in, in 2015. Uh, in 2015, we invited the head of home entertainment at one of the big six motion picture studios to come and talk to our class in Pittsburgh. Um, and, and he came out and he gave a great talk about how technology is changing his business. And during the question and answer time, my colleague Rahul asked him, are you at all worried about the threat that Netflix and Amazon and Google might pose to your business? And this was his quote. He said, and this is, this is a direct quote. He said, you know what? My business is different. The same six studios in my industry have been around for the last hundred years. There's a reason for that. And by implication, that's not gonna change. Okay, and this is a fun mic drop quote that you can you, you can use in class, and the students will get all angry. You know, how could somebody be you know say say something like that in 2015? Really, he didn't see the threat posed by Netflix, Amazon, and Google, and you sort of let them indulge in that anger for a little while, and then you say, but you know what? Let's be a little bit generous to him because what he's saying is 100% correct historically. The same six studios had dominated his industry for the last hundred years. And it's not like the internet was the first technological shift they'd faced. They'd faced massive technological shifts in every aspect of how content was created, distributed, and consumed. And yet the same six studios maintained power. Um, and Rahul and I got so interested in that question that we decided to write a book. So in 2015, we wrote a book called Streaming, Sharing, Stealing, Big Data and the, and the Future of Entertainment. Um, I put the picture up here because uh, I get $1.25 in royalties every time somebody buys one of these. My wife and I have three kids in college right now. So, you know, you'll figure it out. Um, but the three questions we were trying to answer in this book are, number one, will technology change power in entertainment? Number two, will technology hurt the quality of entertainment? And then number three, how should industry leaders respond? Um, and just real quickly, when you look at, you know, will technology change power and entertainment? What we did is we went back to the fundamentals of industry power. And what we said is, you know what? The same six studios have dominated this industry for the last hundred years because they controlled three key scarce resources. They controlled the scarce financial and technical resources you need to make content. They controlled access to the scarce channels you need to distribute content. And they were able to use copyright law to create an artificial scarcity in how people got access to content. And none of the technological shifts they'd faced over the past hundred years had changed the importance of those scarce resources. And yet in 2015, they were facing a series of simultaneous technological shifts that were suddenly making it far easier to um, to create content, far easier to distribute content, and through digital piracy, far easier for consumers to bypass the, the normal ways of, of paying for content and get it for free. What we argue in the book is that the new scarce resource is customer attention. And guess what? At least at that time, the studios didn't own their customer in any of their channels. Netflix, Amazon, and Google um, were the people who owned their customer and owned the key customer data, okay? So that's how we answered the, the first question here. The second question is, will technology hurt the quality of entertainment? Um, and what's really interesting is there were a lot of people at that time who were arguing that, yes, um, if you have data-driven companies like Netflix, Amazon, and Google, using their data to make creative decisions, you're gonna make a mess of, of, the, of the creative industry, right? So this is John Landgraf, there's a whole thing going on right now in Silicon Valley saying, we're gonna use algorithms to make creative decisions. I say, posh, you can't. Um, what's interesting about that though is, is that prediction makes perfect sense 
until you start to look at who's winning the, the awards at the big shows. And what you discover is Netflix, Amazon, and Google are taking home, you know, a whole bunch of awards from all of the top award outlets. So much so that a lot of people are referring to today as the golden age of entertainment, okay? So that's the answer to question one. Question two, question three is how should industry leaders respond? Um, and here, what I'm gonna argue is we saw something really interesting in the entertainment industry. And the entertainment industry faced massive technological disruption. And yet, I think you could make a perfectly reasonable argument that the industry is doing just fine, right? That you know, the normal, the normal end to any good disruption story is and the incumbent died, right? You know, Kodak dead, Blockbuster dead, uh, Britannica dead. What's really interesting about the entertainment industry is they're doing just fine. Um, why is that? And, and what I'm gonna argue is that the reason the entertainment industry is doing just fine is that they initially saw technology correctly as a threat to their business model, as a threat to their way of doing business, and it was. At some point though, I saw them make a shift. And I remember vividly sitting in a, um, a, a Hollywood studio uh, dining room with a pretty senior creative person um, and having that person sort of lean forward, you know, as I'm talking about the changes that, that his industry is facing, lean forward and quietly, so nobody else in the, in the room can hear him quietly say, the show I worked on, we sold my show to Netflix a year ago. I want you to go watch the season of my show that Netflix just made. And you're gonna see that it is in every way superior to what we did on the lot. The storytelling is, is better, the cinematography is better, and I just can't figure it out. And I really think there was a piece in time where the entertainment industry realized that yes, technology is a threat to my way of doing business, but it might be a great enabling force behind my mission, right? My mission is not selling shiny plastic discs for 15 bucks a pop. My mission is creating great entertainment and getting that entertainment in front of an audience. Um, and if, net, if, if technology can help me fulfill my mission, I'm willing to blow up my business model and create all the, all the wonderful platforms we see today, all right? What does that have to do with higher education? At the beginning of the pandemic, um, I heard Michael Drake, uh, Michael Drake, then president of Ohio State, before he was the president of Ohio State, he was chancellor at UCI. And after he left Ohio State, he left Ohio State to become the president of the UC system. So Michael Drake should be very familiar to you. Anyway, in 2020, um, Michael Drake was asked almost exactly the same question um, that Rahul asked the entertainment executive. He was basically asked, do you see technology companies as a threat to higher education? Um, and he gave an answer and I'm, I've printed it up just, just so you'll know how badly I'm paraphrasing him. I printed up the actual words he used, but what I heard him say was, you know what? My business is different. The same 62 universities have dominated my industry for the last 500 years. There's a reason for that. And that's not going to change. Okay. Again, paraphrasing dramatically. And that got me really interested in this, in this question, right? Could we, could we use something of the same framework that we use to think about the entertainment industry to think about technological change in the context of higher education. I recognize these are two very, very different industries. I recognize that they have you know, different purposes. And if you wanna push back on in the Q&A time, I will accept that. But could we use something of a similar framework to think about this? Um, so the first question I'm trying to answer in the book is will technology change power in, in education? And what's really interesting about this is Clay Christensen, the father of disruptive change theory in 2013, argued that higher education is just on the edge of the crevasse, right? Universities are doing very well financially, so they don't feel from their data that the world's going to collapse. But even five years from now, these enterprises are going to be in, in real trouble. So 2013, Clay Christensen predicted that five years from then, 
the universities were going to be in real trouble. And yet here we are 10 years out. And I think you could argue not much has changed, right? So one thing I'm going to try to do is explain why Clay Christensen's prediction in 2013 was wrong then and why today might be, might be different. And the framework I'm going to try to use is something very similar to what we did with the entertainment industry and try to go back to the fundamentals of why the same 62 universities have dominated higher education since the 1520s. And I'm going to argue that we control our own three scarce resources, right? Power in higher education today, particularly in the US, is based on your ability to control access to the scarce seats in the classroom, your ability to control access to the scarce faculty experts who deliver instruction, and your ability to control access to the scarce signals or credentials that are key to someone's ability to, to succeed in, in the professional workplace, all right? And what I'm gonna argue is that MOOCs and the other things that were going on um, in, in 20, you know, in, in the early um, days of, of MOOCs, that MOOCs made the first two of these things relatively more abundant, but they didn't really change the scarcity in the credential and the signal. Um, you can take as many, you know, edX or Coursera classes as you want, um, but it's not going to add up to the power of a traditional college degree, particularly a traditional a, a college degree from an elite university. If that's true, then I think a lot of our business power is hinged on this idea that we have monopoly power over who gets credentialed for the professional workplace. And I think that is about to change. Um, and I'd love to interact with you on uh, during, during the Q&A time about what, what makes me think that, okay? But I think our business model right now is hinged on our ability to control access to who, who, gets, who gets to work in the professional workforce, okay? That's my argument for why I think technology has the potential to change power in higher education. Would this hurt the quality of education? And, and most people I talk to define quality education as education delivered in, in person. Um, and if you define quality as, you know, it has to be done face to face, then yes, remote education will be uh, of lower quality by definition. Um, I'm trying to encourage us to broaden our definition of quality. Um, and, and here's my starting point. If you go back to 1947, um, Harry Truman established a commission on higher education, the Truman Commission. And um, in 1947, that commission came back with a report and a key part of the report says, you know what? The democratic community cannot tolerate a society based upon education for the well-to-do alone. College opportunities are restricted to those in the higher income brackets. The way is open to the creation and perpetuation of a class society which has no place in the American way of life, right? Inspiring words. And yet here we are 70 years later and what we know, and here I'm citing Raj Chetty's research at, at Harvard, what we know from Raj Chetty's work is that if you're born into the top one, a family in the top 1% of the income, uh, of, of income in the US, you have a one in four chance of attending an elite college where elite is defined as a top 80 university in the United States, one in four chance. If you're born into the bottom 20% of income, you have a one in 300 chance of, ascend, of attending the same college. Um, and please hear me say this, I'm saying this provocatively, not declaratively, but, but let me just say provocatively, I'm trained as an economist, so I believe in the efficient allocation of scarce resources, right? Access to elite universities is by definition a scarce resource. If we genuinely believe that rich kids are 77 times more capable of an elite education than poor kids are, then we're doing great and we don't need to change a thing. But if we don't believe that, and I don't know anyone who does, if we don't believe that, then this is a terrible way to allocate access to the scarce resource of higher education, and we ought to want to change. So I'm going to try to create an argument that we have a moral obligation to change. Um, 
I'm going to also create an argument that we have a financial obligation to change. My brother-in-law dug this up uh, from his grandfather's estate. This is the bill for his grandfather to attend uh, Northwestern University in 1936. Um, in 1936, his total fees were $167. If you push that forward to $2022, that would be $3,362 to attend Northwestern University. How much does it cost to attend Northwestern University today? A little less than 10 times more than that. Over the past 40 years, the cost of college tuition has grown at a rate exceeding the rate of inflation by four times. Um, I'm gonna argue that is, that is financially unsustainable, okay? And then the last thing I'm gonna argue is that these are systemic problems. So this is Jason England in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Elite college admissions is at root a story of class warfare. This is not directly attributable to any fault or desire on the part of admissions deans. It's simply a byproduct of the parameters within which the system operates. Um, if you're following your incentives, you're going to want to make your access to your campus as exclusive as possible. And there are a whole bunch of incentives to make sure that the people you admit are, are wealthy enough to keep the business model running. And again, happy to interact with you on that. All right. Now, what's the alternative? Could we imagine a world where online education could create high quality education um, in a way that would be very difficult in person? And to think about that, let me let me show you um, a particular example. So this is this is Molly Smith. This is my daughter, Molly, who just started at Carnegie Mellon University, their engineering program. Um, this, this is a picture of her when she was a high school senior. She, is pres she was president of the Steminist Club at her high school. So take feminism and combine it with STEM, you get Steminism. Um, and in her senior year, she wanted to take AP Physics. And what her high school told her was, you can't take AP Physics because you haven't taken AP Calc and you can't take AP Calc because you haven't taken uh, pre-calc. And me as her dad said, you know, well, screw that. Um, I know of this platform called Outlier that will give people credit at the University of Pittsburgh for taking online calculus. She's gonna take online calculus. And if, she's pa if she passes, I'm gonna dare you as a high school administrator to explain to me why she's not ready for calculus. And now you know how annoying I can be as a father. But anyway, let me show you the trailer for outliers calculus class. And just munch on that for a second, a trailer for a calculus class. This is the trailer for outliers calculus class. If you have a little bit of anxiety around the idea of taking calculus, I would encourage you to give it a chance. We don't all learn in the same way. So we are going to be teaching the same content in different ways. I'd say my teaching style is somewhat laid back. I'm the only instructor that's using a blackboard. And I prefer a fountain pen and paper. I want to make calculus a bit more human. I'll be teaching with a tablet. We're gonna look at the infinitely large, the infinitely small. There's gonna be a lot of storytelling alongside the calculus. I hate to do this to my hometown team, but we're going to look at the Buffalo Bills fan base as our example for exponential decay. So here we go. Low D high minus high D low over low low. What? Let's piece it together. There are these mathematical functions in the things that make us happy. This is an example of taking something in the real world and giving you more information through the equations. Basically, if you're in your 20s, enjoy it while it lasts. There is no reason why everyone shouldn't have access to the very best education. I hope this course can be a gateway to help students from different backgrounds to start their college career. Calculus is this place where once you've mastered the rules, you can let your curiosity run completely riot. Welcome to Calculus One. Let's get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. All right, so if, if we were doing this interactively, I'd ask you what you saw. And based on what I've, what I've heard in, in other settings, what you would say is incredible production value, um, three 
very different styles and three very different uh, uh, diverse faculty. Um, and, you know, a, a pretty inspiring presentation. Um, when my daughter took this class, what's really interesting is that each of those three professors, Hannah Fry, John Urschel, and Tim Chartier, teach the same topic, but they teach it in their own voice and with their own, with their own examples, right? So you can sort of run through, um, you know, John, John Urschel teaches it one way, teaches exponential decay with the Buffalo Bills fan base. Tim Chartier teaches exponential growth in terms of uh, a, you know, a, a, a viral post online. Hannah Fry teaches, uh, teaches exponential decay in terms of the, the happiness you get from cleaning your room. Um, what's interesting is Outlier says, you know, try out different professors and go to the one who, who you gravitate towards, right? The one that speaks to you the most. And what was really interesting to me as the father of a Steminist daughter is my daughter immediately gravitated towards Hannah Fry. Um, and I was mentioning this to a colleague, like, isn't it interesting that my daughter, instead of Tim Shardy or John Urschel, my daughter, my daughter gravitates towards Hannah Fry. And this colleague of mine says, Mike, you know, you don't know the literature. What the literature tells us is that there is generally a gender performance difference between men and women in STEM classes. And that performance difference goes away when the class is taught by a woman. And guess what? The same thing is true of ethnic minorities, right? If all you see are white guys like me and, and you're, you're in an ethnic minority, you might get the false impression that this is not for me. But if you see even just a couple folks who look like you, that tends to, at least according to this AER paper, um, reduce the dropout rates and increase uh, uh, and reduce the performance gap, all right? Last thing I'm gonna argue is how should leaders in higher education respond? And I'm gonna make the same claim I made, made before. When I talk to people in higher education, the sense I get is that we are desperately trying to protect our business model. We see technological change as a threat to our way of doing business. And we are fighting tooth and nail to keep technology from changing us. I would much, much, much rather see us take a step back and say, what's our mission as educators? And might it be possible to use technology to better fulfill our mission as educators in a somewhat similar way to the way the entertainment industry used technology to create a golden age of entertainment? I wonder whether we in higher education could use technology to make a golden age of, of, of education. And that's, that's really what I'm trying to accomplish in, in this book is to get us thinking about that, okay? And with that, I will say, Thank you very much. And we'll turn it back over to, to Vijay and you guys to pepper me with questions. Hey, Michael, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your thinking about uh, what's happening in higher education. I wanna start with, you know, my center does a lot of stuff with business executives on the outside. And we are hearing this message in their own industries in much the same way you're describing higher education. So it's not just about building better, building better, stronger businesses. It's also about building a, a better world. Uh, and I see an a hand of applause going up for you back. There you go. There is some way of showing energy, uh, even though you can't see, see the audience. But I'll just give you a quick example and I'll turn it over back to you. So, you know, just like you talked about in education and this disparity based on Rod Chetty's work is profound. I'm certainly of the opinion that you you have to confront this head on because where we've ended up in in quotes and equilibrium, at least for the time being, is not, at least to me, a good place to be. So when I was talking to the CEO at Abbott Labs and one of the things he told me, very similar to what you said, he said the difference in life expectancy between rich countries and less and poor countries is 18 years. And he says in this day and age when knowledge transfer, travels as fast as it does, it's just completely unconscionable. So for example, their freestyle Libre device, which is a blood sugar monitor that you wear the size of two stacked coins, tracks your sugar for two weeks. You know, they consciously chose to design it in a way that they could offer it at low cost. And he said, our market research actually showed us there was an inelastic demand. We could price it twice or two and a half times as high as we are currently doing. But he said, I wanted to have one effective global price so that everybody has access to the same device. I see education and healthcare is 
two of these industries where we're essential and valuable and we're always struggling with, you know, what's the right model, if you will. So I, I love your focus on uh, mission, which I think is something we should all take to heart. But my question to you about mission is like, have you seen, like, have we started on this journey yet? Like, where are where are schools? Where are universities? How, where are we in this in this hopefully in this hopeful positive transformation? Um, I don't in in the in the book. I argue I don't think we know what our mission is. Um, okay. And my evidence for this is I actually had asked uh, Kristen Yeager. Big shout out to Kristen Yeager. Kristen Yeager heads up our initiative for digital entertainment analytics. And I asked her to go out and look at the mission statements for the top 10 universities in the US News and World Report ranking. And what she came back with is their mission statements average, average 84 words. And when you actually look at them, they're completely impenetrable. And so in the book, I used the example of Carnegie Mellon's mission statement, which I think is 92 words. And you just, you just read it and you have no idea what our mission is, right? And then I said, okay, go out and gather the mission statements for the top 10 most valuable brands. And they, mm -hmm. add, they averaged, I think, 18 words yep. and they were just absolutely crystal clear. You know, Google, our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And then I said, go out and gather the mission statements for the top 10 online educational platforms. And they averaged 12 words and yep. they were even more precise. Um, and I, it, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, um, but, you know, one of them is to create a world-class education, free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, right? That's a mission statement, friends. I would love for us as higher education to take a step back and say, what's our, what's our real mission here? And then use that as energy to say, let's, let's pivot in a way that can help us fulfill that mission. Yeah, I would argue that the University of California is trying really hard. We are focused aggressively on reach, but there's clearly a lot more we could be doing just given sort of the reach uh, and, and richness of technology and what it enables as you just showed that wonderful sort of trailer for, for Calc 1. Uh, and so, so, so that's, but, but talk to me a little bit about um, this, you know, you talked about the three kinds of scarcity, two of which are easily sort of addressed with technology, but the third is the scarcity in credentials. Uh, Clearly, you know, the job market, people still look at where did you go to undergraduate school? What was your GPA? You know, all proxies for how good a worker do you think they will be? But we're beginning to see some change in that with LinkedIn learning and, and, and you know, Google saying, if you take the following courses, uh, whatever, whatever, Udacity does the same thing. Do you, how do you see that play out? The, the whole sort of scarcity and credentials slash the impact of technology on that? What, I mean, the, the case I'm trying to make in the book is the book is not the death of the university. The, right. the, the university is going to be just fine, right? Um, you know, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, they're going to be just fine. I hope Carnegie Mellon and, and UCI are going to are going to be are just going to be just fine, right? The the book is about can we create opportunities for students who are left out of the current system to to, to, to learn new skills and then signal those skills to, to employers. Um, and and it, it's, that, it's that signaling thing that's the hard nut. And, and I, I swear to you, you know, I was, I was really scratching my head about this as I was writing the book one day. And, you know, like, how do you change, you know, Carnegie Mellon is a brand, right? Yeah. At some level, how do you change brand value? Right, these brands are these enduring things that don't change. And I was really scratching my head about this. And later on that day, I found myself buying a scanner from a manufacturer, you know, a pretty expensive scanner from a manufacturer I'd never heard of before on Amazon solely because that scanner had a 4.9 star rating and a whole bunch of really positive reviews. And there was this sort of light bulb moment where you go, Oh, that's how you change the value of a brand name. You add information. Um, what might that look like in the context of education? Uh, the example I'm using in the or one of the examples I'm using in the in the book is this example that was talked about in Wired magazine of this guy. Um, he graduated from the 13th best Brazilian engineering college. He's working as a petroleum engineer for the Brazilian state oil company. 
And in the evenings, he likes to participate in Kaggle data analytics competitions. And he's gotten good enough at Kaggle data analytics competitions that he's risen to the top of the Kaggle worldwide leaderboard. And now he's getting recruited by Silicon Valley companies, not because of his degree, not because of his GPA, not because of his work experience, but because they can see objectively, this guy's good at data analytics. Yeah. Uh, could we add information to your signals about, about your value that are distinct from your brand affiliation um, and use that as a way to break the, the college credential stranglehold? I think we can, and I think we are. Yes, it sounds to me like you're talking about the democratization of sort of rating quality at some level, right? Because when I'm, when Jeff Bezos launched reviews by normal people, everybody thought that was the dumbest, everybody, the critics thought that would be a dumb feature. Who would want to read um, reviews from the average citizen versus these talented critics from the most premier publications that turn out we all care uh, yeah. about that, right? And I have one uh uh, to the audience, if you could, we have one fascinating question, which I'm going to go to next. Uh, but so please start posting your questions to Q and A. Uh, one of the things that you said that really struck me as important was we need to rethink how we measure quality, yeah. um, because you know you 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 almost sort of said it, which is like you know if you define it this way, then the answer becomes that. But this is the time when we need to rethink. So. What are some of them? And I think you were trying to include uh, more what you're calling social justice metrics, but there's many ways to define quality, which it could also be the fact that I made it easier for somebody to attend. Um, you know, I'm teaching executive MBA right now. And when you listen to the request, or can I take this class from home, that every single one of them is legitimate. You know, I've got a sick kid, I'm, I'm sick myself and whatever, and, and I've got constraints. And I, I think we're not, measuring all of these things about convenience, uh, fit to the audience, all of those things. These are all sort of in a way quality metrics. I'll give you, I mean, you, you've, you've teed up a really nice example from, from the book. Um, so as I've given this talk at a bunch of different universities, I was at, let's just say a top five business school. Um, uh, and they, you know, they, I'll, I'll keep it anonymous, right? But I gave this talk and during my meetings with, with faculty, one of the faculty members said, we have a great executive education program. Um, we bring executives from around the country to our campus for an eight week residential executive education program. We have always believed it needs to be residential to create those you know, uh, uh, cohort effects, blah, blah, blah. And the only problem with our exec ed, with our residential exec ed program is female executives aren't showing up in anywhere near the numbers we know they exist in the marketplace. During COVID, we took that residential program online and guess what? Female executives showed up in the proportions you would, you would expect. Um, my, and if my daughter were here, my daughter would say, you know, accurately, through, through a, a set of processes that we'll describe as the patriarchy, um, what we've discovered is that female executives can't take seven weeks off to move to a different, a different city in the same way male executives. Yeah. Right? Unfair, absolutely. True, absolutely. When they took this program online, they were able to increase the diversity. And what this person told me is the value they got from that increased diversity was so good that they're going to take that program online permanently. Um, I wonder whether if we look at our processes today, we'll find, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of other ways that our current system is excluding deserving yeah. people solely because they can't, you know, fit into our mold of how people get educated. You know, that's our, the motivation for, why we're offering an online, fully online major for transfer students in business at the undergraduate level. Because, yeah. you know, we offer a very in-demand major, but we realized a few years ago, a lot of people who were eligible to attend and were qualified couldn't afford to, you know, you saw the whole graduate student strike. A lot of it is about cost of living in California. And much of, in fact, pretty much where there's a prominent university, the cost of living seems to go up, right? And, and so this is a very real concern, and that's what we're trying to do for this population. So uh, let me ask you the question from, from uh, Noah Askin, which was, he thanks, begins by thanking you for a compelling talk. How do you think about the social side of educational experience? 
network, community building that goes on in an in-person educational experience. I see that as a big point of differentiation between entertainment and education. Higher ed doesn't have a monopoly on in-person social, nor is it necessary for everyone to learn, but it would seem to be a differentiator. Yeah, it's it's differentiator, um, no doubt. Um, let me make two points about that. The, the first one is, yes, it's a differentiator. Um, you know, that, that in-person coming of age experience, no doubt it's valuable. Um, I don't think that in-person education is the only way to create that experience. Yep. And I don't necessarily think it needs to cost a quarter of a million dollars and take four years of a person's time to get that experience, right? You so throw one heck of a party for a quarter of a million dollars. You can throw one heck of a party for a quarter of a million dollars. And in fact, what we saw during COVID were a lot of people creating living arrangements where, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to live in community while we take classes online. So that'd be my first, my first pushback on that. The second pushback that, and Noah, you didn't frame it this way, so I'm, I'm not going to abuse you, but, but sometimes I hear it framed as, no, 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 the real value of college are the, is the people you meet and those people's ability to open doors for you later in your career. Um, once you say that, what you're arguing is that, you know, it's those people you're going to meet and who are going to be able to open doors for you later in your career. That's the value of college, Right. What sort of people are we talking about though, right? Who are the people who are more likely to be able to open doors for you later on in your career? I would argue that they're disproportionately kids from wealth. Um, and if, if we're gonna tie ourselves to a business model that says a key part of our value is we're gonna expose you to a bunch of wealthy, powerful kids, um, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Does that make sense? You're making a face, VJ. If you want to push back, no, no. I, I, I'm reading questions. To be honest, uh, to figure, um, no, no. I think that uh, you know we'll let Noah comment on that if he has a follow up. But and, and Noah, I want to be clear. That's not the question you ask. You know, I, I, I'm asking a different question, but but I appreciate your question. So we have actually a, a question from Pramod Kargonikar, who is our vice chancellor for research. He says, can you comment on new business models for the abundant university of the future? Because, you know, people like him are actually charged with sort of thinking through how do you actually put some of this into practice? So what is the model uh, at this point? Anyway? I think, I mean, I, I think what we know about digitization and all sorts of other sectors is scale is going to be absolutely key, right? Getting, getting, getting to scale and then I think the second thing that's going to be really interesting and, and I would argue really important is getting that data about, about the student and starting to use that data to understand what are their needs, what are their backgrounds, and how can I craft the information for them in a way that's going to help them maximally. Um, I've talked to education entrepreneurs who say, you know what, the moat that protects my business model is the data that I'm currently collecting about, about students, how they learn, um, what, how we can deliver. So I think, A, it's going to be getting to scale, and B, it's going to be intelligently using the data that we have to more effectively deliver educational experiences for the individual. Um, if you look at what's going on today, ASU and Southern New Hampshire University, and to, I would argue, a lesser extent, Western governors are, have a leadership position in terms of going, going to scale. Um, but I think there's still opportunities for, for universities to, to get into that business. Yeah, and you know, to your point, we're already seeing it at our school. Uh, a few days ago, I actually got an I know my current students are on are watching, so I have to be cautious here. But I, I did get a I did get a notification from the learning management system that said a certain number of students are not actually turning the pages of, of, of the reading packet or aren't on Canvas, which is a learning management system, as much as um, other students seem to be. And you know, it was the first time I'd received a message like that. So I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. I'm still trying to figure it out, but it gives you an insight into who might be struggling, who's got other challenges, who's interested, who's not interested. Uh, uh, and you know, is it a matter of effort? Is it a matter of constraint? But there's so much more we can do with customization is what I hear you saying. That that's yeah, that's my argument, right? And, and you know, sort of think of the parallels between this and programming for primetime television. Yes. 
right? If you're programming for primetime television, you're trying to keep the middle of the audience happy. Mm -hmm. um, when I teach to a class of 30 students, I'm quite sure 10% of them are bored and I'm quite sure that 10% of them are lost. But A, I don't have any idea who they are, but B, even if I did, I'm trying to keep the middle 80% of the audience happy. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if I could identify using some of the technologies you're talking about, these are the people who are bored and you know, let, let's let them go forward. These are the people who are lost, not because they're stupid, but because they didn't grasp a key concept. Let's give them the time they need to grasp that concept and then move on at, at their own pace. We just can't do that in our current time bound, space bound mode of delivery. Yeah, and if you and if you think about how Netflix does recommendations, every time you finish a show, and in fact, before you finish a series, we're already prompting with you the next things you should watch. I mean, we should be able to infer people's skills and capabilities and think about the you know this is the sequence of courses you might want to consider, or this is your career interest. Think about this, and you haven't seemed to register for courses like that that we think might help you. There's so much more we could be doing. Uh, let me go to another. Go ahead, go ahead, I'm just like watching my kids learn calculus, right? Like I, I watched my son, you know, do integration by parts and, yeah. and he, ma he made a mistake, right? Um, on an online platform and, and they identified the mistake. You know, the only way you can make this mistake is by not grasping this concept. And they basically said, go back, reread this concept and then come back and we'll give you a new set of questions to see if you grasped it. I just can't do that in the classroom. Yeah. At scale. Uh, David Ochi is actually an alum and he's now doing some really interesting work on innovation. Dr. Smith, thank you for your amazing insights. One area that is going to come to the forefront is the distinction between research and teaching in higher ed. Creation of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge seem primed to be decoupled. Do you see any evidence that technology will aid in that decoupling? Do you see this as valuable or detrimental? I'll take, so David, I'll take a, a slightly different tack on this. Um, so one of the things I noticed during the pandemic is that when you teach online, it's much easier to get outside experts to come in, right? That when, when you say, instead of, do you have three days to travel to Pittsburgh and give a guest lecture to my class? Do you have 80 minutes on Tuesday to Zoom in? A lot of people will come, right? And that really got me thinking, you know, like, as a professor, my value in the university is that I'm a specialist, right? That I, you know, whether, whether you, you know, that the goal of getting tenure is to become the world's recognized expert in this incredibly narrow area of the field. So my value as a researcher is I'm a specialist. But when I teach, I teach like a generalist. Right. I teach I teach Vijay's work on, you know, on on the business value of technology. I teach Catherine Tucker's work. I teach, um, you know, Eric Brynjolfsson's work. Wouldn't it be cool if you could learn from Vijay and and Catherine and and Eric and give me time to to really focus in on the places where I am the expert? Um, we can't do that because VJ's at UCI and Eric's at Stanford and Catherine's at MIT, but we could do that on, online. So I can see an argument that we might actually see research become even more value when I can be a, a specialist to a broader audience than I can at Carnegie Mellon's university. And, and we got the question I was sure we were going to get. What do you, this is from Roger. What do you think of the implications for higher education with the introduction of publicly available AI tools like chat GPD? It's on everybody's minds in higher education and certainly the students' minds. I have never seen more excitement about an AI technology and I've been teaching it for a few years now than chat GPT just because it simplifies the interface so much. Uh, it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I think we as educators are going to have to come up with new ways of evaluating student, student knowledge, um, you know, so that, that's, that's fairly, fairly clear. Um, I also wonder whether it's going to mean we need to, to teach different skills, mm -hmm. right? You know, in, in the, in the same sense that in a world of automatic spell checking, you know, spelling isn't quite as important as it once was. I wonder whether chat GPT is going to going to force us to shift the focus from from these skills to these to these other set of set of skills. You know, um, one of the things we've always argued for is more critical thinking skills and so much of higher education, you know, India was all about rote memorization. Um, and 
you know, when you can get ChatGPT to answer the question, you really don't need to memorize much. You know? yeah. uh, so I think that that's, you know, the, your book is almost done. And this, of course, happened in the last few weeks. I think it's going to be an interesting appendix somewhere at some point in time. Uh, that's the that's the challenge of teaching technology, right? The books, new stuff happens all the time. Next question from Kevin. Why do you think so many schools are claiming that in-person classes are the only way for education to be quality courses? There is that inbuilt assumption, isn't there? It's And it's a fascinating discussion. It's a fast... So, I wrote a piece in the Atlantic at the beginning of the pandemic that argued that higher education in 2022 looked a lot like the entertainment industry did in 2015. I gave a lot of talks on, on that topic at different universities and pretty consistently about 15 minutes in, you know, someone's going to raise their hand and go, no, 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 this will never happen because one, the one thing we know from COVID is that online education has been a disaster. Um, and after about the fifth time I got asked the question, I realized how to respond, which is to say, oh, that's really interesting. How much worse do you think the online education we delivered during COVID was? Do you think it was like 20% worse or maybe 50% worse? And they'd sort of him and haw, but, but you know, sort of somewhere in that range. Oh, that's really interesting. How much of a discount does your university offer for the 20 to 50% lower quality product you delivered during COVID? And if the answer is zero, what do you make of that, right? Um, so I think that there's a little bit of, of hypocrisy associated with, you know, oh, online education is inherently inferior for anybody who works on a college campus that didn't offer a discount. But the second thing I'd argue is what we want to conclude is that because the education we delivered during COVID was inferior, online education will never be as good as the in-person experience. And, and the only way we can claim that is if the online, if the, if the education we delivered during COVID represented the pinnacle of the use of the medium, and none of us believes it does, right? Yeah. So our ability to use that medium is going to get better over, over time. The other thing I don't think we recognize is that I don't think most of the students, and I'll be a little bit provocative here, I don't think most of our students are here for the learning. I think they're here for the credential. Yep. And as long as the credential has the same value it did before COVID, I think they got every penny they paid for. But once you acknowledge the technology is going to get better and that it's the credential, not the learning that most people are there for, I think you've got to acknowledge that online education poses a threat. Yeah, uh, we ha I have time for one more question. And even mm -hmm. that would require Mike to stay a couple more minutes past our closing time. So uh, with happy, your, happy to, happy with to. Your, with your indulgence, we'll, we'll take a couple more questions. So uh, this is a question from Praveen. Regarding your point in social justice, if abundant universities want to get a higher proportion of students from, let's say, the lowermost financial strata, how do you think universities can select high, good quality students you know, if they can't afford to take the SAT, the ACTs, or they don't have the best GPAs because they have to miss so many days of school, for example, because they're working for, uh, how do you evaluate quality of input of the students, the students who are applying, I should say, better, better phrasing? I'm gonna argue that, this is a great question, uh, Praveen. Um, I'm gonna argue that judging the quality of the input upfront becomes much less important in an era of abundance. And what do I mean by that? So the outlier, um, outlier will give people a full refund on their on the class if you do the work and don't pass. Um, why can they do that? They can do that because an added student doesn't really impose any additional cost on the system, right? If I've only got 30 seats in this classroom and you, Praveen, come and you fail the class, that's bad because I could have made better use of that scarce resource. But if access to the classroom is abundant, I think it fundamentally changes the economics of how we think about this. And it might allow us to take some chances on students who might not look good on paper, but who might be incredibly talented when you actually get them into the classroom. Um, and I see we, I think we see a lot of examples of this in, in online MOOCs of students, you know, in, in Mongolia who, you know, on paper, you wouldn't think this is a great student, but when you actually see how they perform in the class, they're, they're top, you know, they're top in the class. Um, so I think this can allow us to take more chances on students. The other thing, I think it, it can change the, you know, 
if, if a student didn't grow up in the right school district, I think it might allow us to give them more time to catch up to the other students where today we just don't have that time. So I'm going to end with one question, a provocative question, I would argue, from Jeff Greenberg. You have a base assumption that the mission of the university is to educate people, but the mission of faculty members might be publishing, grant acquisition, monetization, and then education, and then education, I, emphasis added by Vijay. How have these priorities shifted over our time? Are our top faculty still driven to educate? Vijay and I have actually talked about this, Jeff. Um, I think there is a real disconnect between the incentives of faculty and the business model of the university, right? Um, what I was told, and I tell the story in the book, you know, what I was told as a junior faculty member is spend as little time as possible on your, on your teaching, because teaching will not help you get tenure, um, and it takes time away from the really important thing, which is research. Um, when I was a junior faculty member, I was at a conference where a senior faculty member who I knew I was going to need to have write a letter of recommendation for me when I went up for tenure asked me, how are things going, Mike? And I said, oh, you know, things are going well. I'm getting some papers out. And oh, by the way, I won the teaching award for our school last semester. And he said, totally straight faced. He said, you know what, Mike, it sounds like you're spending too much time on your teaching. Um, you know, that, that not only not only isn't teaching valuable, but it's it is it's actually a negative signal, because if you were a real scholar, you would you wouldn't be wasting your time on teaching. You'd be focused on on research. I think that's a real disconnect. And, but I wonder whether we can use technology, like I say, to take the world's recognized experts and get them in front of the right audience um, and also possibly create different different tracks, um, you know. One of the interesting things is I talked to Aaron Rasmussen, who started Outlier. What he said is, I had to interview 200 calculus professors before I found three that had the stage presence needed to work in this new medium. Um, I wonder whether you know we're gonna we're gonna have to discover new skills for faculty to develop to work in this in this new medium, and whether it's going to be different than the skills we've been incentivizing for a long, long time. Yeah, you know, on that note, you open your book with the story of Masterclass, where you really see the production values and access to the best professors in the world to anybody. You don't have to be in an Ivy League school to learn from Joyce Carol Oates, for example, for 15 bucks a month. And I think that illustrates the power of what some of these new digital business models can be. We're still well early in our journey, but uh, I'm very hopeful for the future. And, and Mike, Thank you so much for not just your time and your writing the book and sort of sharing your thoughts with us, but really about on about inspiring us to think much more broadly about what is our mission. On a positive note to the last question, I think I see among the, you know, in my tenure, which has been rather long at the university level, you know, there is has been a shift back towards teaching. I'm sure we can do a lot more, but that shift is clearly happening because I think we've all understood how the model, the pendulum swung too far to the left. With that. With people like you in our field, I am optimistic for the future, and you know it is our mission to educate. So we, I shall thank you, everybody, for attending. Once again, thank you, KPMG, and thank you to the Beale Family Foundation for supporting our work. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us, and of course, thank you, Mike. And look forward to seeing you all at our next event. Good night, everybody. Thank you.